this could be a weird four episode thing on a random channel that no one's ever heard of. And it's like, great, let's go make it. Because for me, I just want to make cool, interesting stuff. Like, I don't care where it lives, you know, just work with people who are passionate about it. Hello everyone, Perry here with a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night because we were lucky enough to get the wonderful Nanashka Khan in studio today, the director of Always Be My Navy. Hey. Welcome to the studio. Yes, I'm you should my own be chair. doing that. <laughs> really, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting here. Your movie just made me happy. Oh, thank you. And I feel like you. we need more content out there that just like strictly makes you happy and inspires you to do good things with your life. You still have the Corolla? What are you looking at? My back seat? Because we had sex back there? Oh my God. So what do you think? That it might be even smaller and grosser than I remember. Hey, you better still be talking about my back seat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. That's so meaningful. I appreciate that. I wanted to go way back to the beginning okay. and first ask you, at what point did you know you wanted to be a filmmaker or a writer? Ooh. Yeah, definitely writer first, you know. Um, I always like loved movies. My dad was a big old movie buff, so he would like wake my brother and I up in the middle of the night and you know have us come out and watch like old movies with him. So we watched like Breakfast at Tiffany's, Ben Hur, Guys and Dolls, like all the genres. And then he would encourage us to talk about it. He'd be like, why did you like this? Like kind of talk critically about like, what did you think this character was doing? Like, why did you think she did that? You know? You have a good and, dad. I feel like my I parents know. just like sat me in front of a TV and then when I liked it, they just bought all the toys and that was it. <laughs> they were like, Little Mermaid? Great, here you go. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, <laughs> no, so but it made me sort of think, you know, critically about story and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I think like that was like the earliest things. And then I just like, in high school, I wrote a column for my pa like, school paper that was like a kind of op-ed, just so I could do whatever I want, like a humor thing. So. Do you remember what it was about? Oh my God, like I'm sure, I, it was like about like prom, you know what I mean? <laughs> like getting your driver's <laughs> license, like whatever, you know, just kind of boring, <laughs> crazy stuff like that. But. I feel like, that. I mean, that's very important to someone at a certain point in their life. Yes, and, and I can even 15. see, yeah, like little <laughs> things like that could spawn a new story idea, you never know. That's it. Well, and I also really remember liking, cause like whenever the paper would come out, the people would come up to me later in the halls or whatever and be like, oh, I really, I thought your thing was really funny. Like, I really liked it. I remember liking that sort of like time release aspect of being a writer, you mm -hmm. know? It's not like the immediacy of like stand up or theater or something where you're feeling the audience. It's like, they're experiencing it wherever. And well, then it's they a good go. thing you got into TV and film production because there's That's probably it. a big span of time in between whether it's writing a piece of content or I guess not so much in TV. The turnaround might be a little quicker yeah, than it's film a, at least. A little bit, a little bit, but still, you know, it's months and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And film school, because I know you went mm -hmm. to USC. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to go there? And we talk about this all the time because a lot of people always ask, oh, if I want to break into the industry, do I go to school or do I not? And it's right. such a hard question to answer because I know that works really well for some people, but totally. others don't need it. And I think experience in the industry is more helpful in their cases. A thousand percent. Like I went to USC undergrad, so I was there for four years. Uh, I chose USC just randomly. I had been accepted into the general school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just like put international relations because it sounded like, <laughs> I wanted to travel. I'm like, I like traveling, you know, I mean, to relationships or whatever. So I put that down. And then I went to like this weekend seminar thing that my parents made me go to because I lived in Hawaii. And, you know, if you don't have, a, if your family doesn't have money to like see the campuses, they send uh, schools and like representatives out. And I was just, this guy was talking and I was flipping through the book and I saw the school of cinema television. And I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. And then the guy was like, it's very competitive to get in, and I think the deadline was like a week and a half, so that was the hardest I ever worked in uh, high school, was getting my packet ready yeah. for USC. And then once you got to USC, was there anything you specialized in, or do they just kind of broadly teach you about what it means to make films? Uh, well, you have like different, within the film school, it's like production, critical studies, and mm -hmm. writing. Um, and now I think it's like visual arts and animation, or whatever, but um, my emphasis was in writing. So it was primarily in that, but you know, you. You start to direct, they had like acting for writers, they had directing for writers. I love that component of uh -huh. any kind of film program. If you had to pick something that wasn't specifically for the track that you were on that helped you the most after the fact, what would it be? That wasn't specifically for the track I was on. I think it was like probably one of those uh, kind of like psychology classes, like, like insight. There's something called like content and consciousness 
which I don't know what that means, but it's sort of like the idea. Like they put loads in a hat and you yeah. shake it up and you just pick something. I mean, to this day, I have no idea. But I like the way they were sort of talking about like what's underneath the emotion of story, you know, that kind of thing. I could see how something like that could help. Yeah, it was pretty like psychology, I guess. I was know. on the producing track in my school and one of the things that they made us do at the very beginning was we had to take a class called Directing the Actor and they made, like everyone had a turn directing but you always directed your classmates yeah. and even though I always appreciated the craft of acting before, until you're being directed and you're forcing yourself to do something that definitely isn't second nature to you, right. I never really knew what that felt like. Did you find that you were an immediate diva? Like you didn't realize that? Not a diva. I like. I felt like I was like like I wanted to crawl on a ball and die. I, I just really didn't want to do <laughs> so it. They were giving you direction, and you were like, "What do you?" I want? felt very self conscious, and I realized that like I can't make my voice do different things with the same sentence. Once I say it one way, all I can do is keep repeating it that way. It's, You're a lot it's dialed incredible. In. <laughs> now, so we've gotten to school, but at what point, because a lot of people say, I want to be in the industry, but there's a different thing when you actually feel like, oh, now I'm here and I can do it. Like, right. I guess even when you first start with your first job, sometimes it doesn't feel like a real job, but then Definitely that thing not. happens. Definitely not. I mean, you know, for me, kind of going back to what you were saying before, it's like some people just go, should just go into the industry. It's good for some people to go to school for this kind of thing. I think four years, for the final two years, I mean, I appreciated the whole experience, but I started to sort of intern and get that unpaid, you know, job, like hands-on experience. And that's where you're like, you feel you're kind of in between worlds, you know, because you're going to an office, you're not making money, you're basically like collating scripts or like taking the brads out of scripts and like recycling. So you're not really, you know, your hands are all cut up. Like it's yeah. not the ideal, but you're still on the Fox lot or you're, you know what I mean? Like you're at, I interned at National Lampoon was like one of my first. Oh, that um, was probably a fun one. It was, I mean, it was a huge fan and it was cool to be there. And you know, I just like liked being around like kind of the legend of that. Huh. I just remember taking magazines and newspapers and stacking them away in storage just in, just in case they ever wanted to option something. Like, right. kept it for no reason at all besides that, which I didn't quite understand. Yeah. Um, what about people in your life that kind of gave you a chance? Because I feel like it's very important for everyone out there to have, I don't know, that one person to be the first person to throw them a bone, take them under their wing. Was there anybody like that for you? The first person, you know, once I graduated, I'd written this script, which was not good. But for some reason, like, she liked it. She liked my writing. This professor I had, this adjunct professor, who slipped it to um, this woman, Sharon Morrill. And she was like, Disney is hiring. Um, and I was, like, temping and, like, do, like, doing sort of odd things in the first, you know, I think it was six months after graduation or whatever. She sent it to somebody at Disney and they were hiring in their TV animation department, sort of like in-house development writers or whatever. And uh, that was my first job. So the fact that like she Connecting believed the in me. Connecting the dots to Pepper Ann now. That's it. I was the perfect age for that show. Oh my God. I adored that. Oh good, I'm so glad. <laughs> Did you ever think that you wanted to get into animation before you were hooked up with that opportunity? Um, I mean, I enjoyed watching animation, you know, I loved The Simpsons, um, but I wasn't, it was never something that I didn't write any animated scripts or anything mm -hmm. like that. And so I kind of just came like a, a roundabout way to Pepper Ann and Sue Rose, who was an illustrator who created the strip, was like, you know, hire, like wanted to hire me to like be the, you know, head writer and we developed it together. It was pretty amazing. That was grad school for me, really, was... Oh, wow. Be working on that show because I learned like how to make a TV series from beginning to end, you know. Did you feel the pressure of getting an opportunity like that so early on? I mean, I just felt excited. Like I really, like I called up my, they were like, here's your budget. I called up my friends who were still like, my one friend was giving like tram tours at Universal Studios. My other friend was like tamping or whatever. I was like, do you guys want to come right on this kids animated show? They're like, of course. Yes, we do. So we were all just super excited. Like someone was paying us to write. We wanted it to be like Seinfeld, but for kids, you know what I mean? Like we wanted to just like do weird things and make ourselves laugh and kind of, you know, celebrate this idea that Sue had come up with. Yeah, I feel like there wasn't that many shows like it then too. I mean, that was really, yeah. that's really one of the only things that come to mind where it was like, like a show about a young girl who's like weird. And yeah, I don't know, yeah. I always really took to that. Well, that's the thing. She had like this hyper imagination. Yeah. So she would just imagine herself in all these scenarios, raised by a single mom. 
you know, her younger sister was always mistaken for a boy. She had a very deep voice. Pam Adlon was the voice. Yes. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of revolutionary and it was ahead of its time. And we just had a great, great time working on it. What is it like when you finish a project like that, especially when it's still at the very beginning of your career? Because I'll never forget when I got my very first job mm -hmm. and then I fell in love with it and that show was canceled. Mm -hmm. I feel like the first time that happens, it's so difficult to be like, oh, it's OK. I still have my whole life ahead of me. I'm going to find <laughs> the next thing. I mean, I was lucky in that sense because we got to make 65 episodes. So, and each episode was two 11 minute stories. Mm -hmm. So it was like, however many, you know, 130 stories or whatever. Um, so I felt good about like what we did. And I was kind of like ready for the next thing, you know, to move on to the next thing. So I was lucky in that way. And what was the next thing? How long did you have to wait for that? Let's see. I mean, I worked on some different, like I developed a few mm -hmm. things over at Disney, wrote a couple of movies or rewrote some movies. And then my next like TV staff job was Malcolm in the Middle. You're not the boss of me now, and you're not so big. Life is unfair. So I was like, you know, let's try this primetime thing. Let's try this uh, writing for humans thing. <laughs> you have so much TV experience. I'm curious what made you kind of like flip the switch to directing a feature film? Because I yeah. imagine that production process is drastically different. Yeah, I mean, for me, at least the way I've done, you know, being a showrunner in TV, like when I created uh, Don't Trust the Bitch in Apartment 23, and then Gosh. Fresh the Boat. I st I'm still pissed about that. Cancel. I mean, I not wish. Okay. Not okay. Just how illegal is this? About as illegal as that panda fat eye cream you use. Do you use panda on your face? Luther is 76 years old. Shut up. Bitch. I hope we get to do like a Christmas special or something for Netflix. Wouldn't that be so fun? That That's the perfect place to do it. I mean, right? my mind immediately went back to the Sabrina Christmas special, <laughs> which is like like just a really awesome creative opportunity that's for it. a streaming platform like Netflix. That's what makes them stand out. So exactly. I hope they do more things like that. I know, me too. It would be so <laughs> now fun. Now you've planted that bug in my head. <laughs> we got to get that going. <laughs> I wish. Um, but yeah, I, uh, you know, so the way I approach sort of uh, creating TV shows is similar to me to directing a feature because it's all about kind of world building and like creating characters, tone, mm -hmm. things like that. So there, there is definitely differences, but there's a lot of similarities, a lot of crossover. When you first hit the set of this movie, is there anything that you didn't know from your experience before that made you think, oh, that's how they do it on a movie set? Um, or any question that felt like a stupid question that you had? Well, I mean, there was definitely like lens packages was a big learning curve for me, like going to the lens house with my DP, who, you know, Tim Surstret, who's amazing. He's got a ton of experience. He actually shot the first Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure with hmm. Keanu 30 years ago. So they was knew that just like a big coincidence? <laughs> I mean, I think so. But that's when we had Keanu in our movie and he was like, hey, I don't know if you remember me on Tim. He's like, Tim! Excellent! And then they like caught up about 30 years of like, you know, life or whatever. But, um, but that was a big learning curve for me going, you know, because I was explaining the look I wanted. Mm -hmm. I was going for this sort of classic uh, rom-com look of like the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to combine it with sort of this modern day story, this like very 2019 story. I like the idea of the combination of those two. But going into lens, the lens house, I was just like, OK, what's our camera package? Like, I don't like Tim, like, I trust you. He's like, what do you <laughs> what do you like better, this or this? And so we would kind of just have to use like very lame. I would have to just be very visceral because I didn't really know the exact technology. And now I have, after this movie, I could talk about camera oh, packages yeah. for the rest of my life. I have straight, so, straight up opinions. What's the difference with picking a camera package on a movie compared to a TV show? Is all of that just like set in stone from the very beginning so it's never really switched up at all? Yeah, like I never had to do that on the TV show, you know, because I guess when you're doing the pilot, you kind of do that with your DP. Mm -hmm. But television, in at least network comedy, has kind of a look, you yeah. know, like uh, it's, I mean, you can sort of paint with, you know, within these numbers, but you're not going to really break out of like the traditional like ABC look or whatever, you know, so there's, Makes sense. there's a little less uh, stuff to, to work on there. What about the editing process? Because one of my favorite things about Always Be By Maybe is, I mean, just simple things like having the split screen and things like that and certain mm -hmm. music cues, because it really does add a significant amount of energy. And mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know if you had the opportunity to do that in TV. So is that something that you had to kind of adapt into like the pre-production so you knew exactly what you were going to do in that respect when you shot everything? Well, luckily, editing is something that I've had a ton of experience doing in television. I've edited every single episode of 
the shows I've created, you know, so I have over 100 episodes of TV editing experience. So, you know, I, I really love editing because to me it's like that final rewrite, you know, where you can get in there and you can craft mm -hmm. the timing and you can switch things up and you can split screen stuff and you, going into it when I was prepping the shot list, there were some scenes that I was like, I knew I wanted to shoot them in a certain way to allow for, you know, at this point in my career, I know I'm gonna want these options in editing. So it's like I would shoot it one way, then I would shoot it another way um, just to have it in case I wanted to do something different. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm always like a big uh, proponent of people who can have an understanding or at least a little experience in as many different departments as possible. Yeah. Because it really helps the whole production. I mean, for sure. And it's like, I, I would highly recommend people get into and understand editing. You know, there's so many talented editors out there. Lee Haxel, uh, was the editor on this movie. She did like Crazy Stupid Love. You know, she's amazing. And she was great actually at tracking the emotions of every single character in every scene. So I would be focused on whatever, you know, Sasha and, you know, Ali and Randall's character. And then she would be like, oh, but Jenny's over here doing this. And you know what I mean? It's just like she saw everything in a 360 way. Mm -hmm. Which was if cool. you could pick, so you know a lot about lenses, you know a lot about editing. If you could pick <laughs> one department that you're not as familiar with to kind of brush up on or get the 101, what would it be? It's still color correcting. That to me is, you know, that's rough. That's rough. It's, it's because, especially movies, well, this movie's for Netflix, so there's three versions of color correcting you have to do. You have to do HDR, which is the high def, you know, the modern mm -hmm. TVs. Then you have to do SDR, which is standard. Then you have to do theatrical, because we had a theatrical release. Uh -huh. And everything is different, and they explained to me, like, oh, the projector is gonna show it this way, the HDR is gonna, it's like, it, it just, at a certain point, I'm like, guys, what are we doing? Like, I can't wrap my head around this. Wow, there's so, so many things that those I guys are artists. even have thought about. Well, yeah. The first thing I ever got in trouble doing at a job was I was a camera op for a local news station, and one time <laughs> I pressed record, and then I white balanced off the snow, and I got oh. a big lecture about that when I got back to the <laughs> office. <laughs> Never going to do that again. Um, is there anything else about making a movie specifically for Netflix that's really different like that or adds an extra piece to the process? Um, I would say just that is the biggest thing, like the, the different versions of something. You know, there was another, we wanted to shoot almost like the, uh, like a letterbox, you know, style, like 2-4 mm -hmm. yeah. uh, ratio, Tim and I, and that's what we were talking about. And then Netflix got on with us and they were like, hey, you have to keep in mind that a lot of people are going to watch this on their tablets and on their phones. And our re research has shown that people don't like black bars because if you only have a small space that they hit that one option where it just makes it bigger, but you're cutting huh. off some of the frame. So we changed that up. So they have a, Netflix has created this 2-0 ratio, which is not in any other, you know, it's not theatrical, it's not TV. It's this in-between thing. So. Oh, that's so fascinating. Yeah, so I'm like a little nutty with that. Whenever I put something on my iPad, I never expand it because I get crazy about right. not watching the film as intended as by intended. the filmmaker. Exactly. So they're like, you don't want that. You don't, you know, the heads are cut off and whatever. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we adjusted that for Netflix. We're constantly talking about different. I mean, now with the rise of Netflix and all the original content we're, that we're getting from them, we're always talking to filmmakers about how much creative opportunity they have there. So I'm curious about your collaboration with them. You know, what kind of notes do you get from them, or is it just about you guys doing your thing as intended? I mean, I have to say, I've had an amazing experience at Netflix. Like, they really, from day one, we were all on the same page about what movie we were making. And they were invested. So, yeah, they, they gave notes, you know, at all the regular intervals, like after the table read. And, you know, as, as we continued to revise, like getting ready for production. But once we started shooting, they were so supportive. You know, they would come to set. They would be like, what do you guys need? You've been amazing partners. Um, you know, I, I remember, I think it was one of the last few days of shooting, Scott Stuber, who's in charge of the film division, came mm -hmm. and he was like, what, what can we do? And I was like, I can already say that we're going to need more money for music. Like, without even knowing, I already know the music budget's too low. He's like, done. And so it's like, what, you know, as a filmmaker, like, how, what else can you ask for? You it know sounds what I mean? like a dream come true over there. And it, I've heard it from so many yeah. people at this point. It's almost like, yeah, like on the press circuit, you're going to hear that you had a great experience. <laughs> but like, I've heard it from so many different individuals now. Right. And it seems so sincere and like the only way you could take certain risks that we see them taking right now. That's it. And it's like, you know, making movies that have different points of view, mm -hmm. starring different kinds of people, first time filmmakers, women filmmakers. 
and just trusting you to do the job they hired you to do. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's the whole thing. You need people like that around you. <laughs> the other it. thing with Netflix specifically right now is I feel like they're kind of making a really smart move by cornering the market with romantic comedies mm -hmm. because I mean, I'm obsessed with box office, and it doesn't seem like there's all that much room for romantic comedies at the box office right now, which is very upsetting, which right. makes me very happy that we have Netflix. So do you have, like, any kind of take in terms of, like, like why isn't it working there, but it's between your movie, between uh, Set It Up, and, right. and To All the Boys I Love Before. There's just so much special stuff coming out of Netflix right now in that genre. They're killing it. They're killing it. I, You know, it's almost like a chicken and the egg scenario because I feel like, the lack of those kinds of comedies coming out in the traditional studio system in the theaters, you know, created this void that Netflix then filled with these movies. Mm -hmm. And then because you can get these movies at home, which is kind of a little bit the ideal setting for a rom-com because it's cozy in a way. We've just never had that option before, you know, but now that we do, I, I'm wondering if because Netflix is, you know, making all this incredible product, that people are like, you know what, I'll just watch it at home. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. know which, you know, it's an interesting thing. I feel that. I'm, I'm big into the theater and I don't want to ever see that totally. window closed or at least not be isolated to just the biggest of the big mm -hmm. budget wise. Yeah. But I mean, I had, I, I watched your movie at home and it was delightful. I got to sit <laughs> on my cozy couch with my cat and I was that's just it. filled with joy. And it you was get great. your popcorn, you got your wine, exactly. you know, and you're like, that's it. Do you see that happening overall with the industry in terms of like Netflix versus everything else right now, especially with, you know, like Disney's got franchises like Avatar <laughs> in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Are we seeing kind of that low to mid-range budget opportunity on the big screen close? You know, I don't know. I mean, like you said, though, there's there's always going to be something about that shared theatrical experience. Like, I'm so happy that we got that limited release because mm -hmm. otherwise I never would have, I didn't expect it, you know, going in. I thought we would just be on... Netflix. So like to be in the theater and see people kind of react as a group, especially with comedy, um, you know, you don't get that in TV because, again, that's very solitary. So it was uh, it's it's a I can't even describe it. It's like an overwhelming experience to see that. So I hope that there will be a balance, you know, and someone will sort of figure out the rhythms or the algorithms for making that stuff work in the theater, because I would hate for it to go away. Well, it's like all the cards are starting to fall I'm so curious to see how yeah. it I want to like fast forward and just get a quick window into the future and then I'll feel more comfortable now <laughs> you got to tell me who wins the Super Bowl too because we'll I, put some money on that that would be nice <laughs> if I could um I also wanted to ask you a little bit about Keanu For, mm. first all right you've been doing the rounds like does every single interviewer <laughs> ask you about Keanu at this point I mean he's very popular <laughs> he's a popular <laughs> subject if you didn't get him for that part was there any backup or was it only him it honestly was only him and you know but it was almost like blinders on only him because it was like we're probably not going to get him it's like pie in the sky like first draft version um but i'm not going to think about the backup because i'm just pretending like we're going to get him mm -hmm. you know what i mean like head in the sand ostrich style and then we actually heard he wanted to sit down you know we'd sent the script to his agents and we thought we'd never hear back again you know those things just like go into the ether and you're like did anybody hear from keanu like what's happening um, but we heard back that he read it and was into it, so he uh, wanted to meet, and we sat down with him, and he was great. Yeah. So that kind of leads me to my next question. I'm also fascinated by how a marketing campaign comes together and mm -hmm. how a trailer comes together. Was there ever any thought to keep him out of the trailer? Oh yeah. There was a lot of, you know, phone calls and meetings and emails about, you know, getting that. Do We don't want to spoil it, mm -hmm. but rightly so. The marketing team was like, Keanu is a big piece of this. Like, it is a draw. And you can't argue with that. So the compromise was in the trailer, the full trailer, we had him at the end, but we didn't say that he was playing himself. He just came in and people were like, oh my God, Keanu's in this. So it was like a compromise. Okay. We, you know, he's in it, but you don't know exactly what he's it doing. It makes sense. And personally, I didn't feel like it took away from the surprise whatsoever. Good, good. And I got all the, all the disclaimers, do not spoil this. And we most <laughs> certainly were not going to. 
Yeah. Is there anything from the experience of making this movie that you're going to take with you on your next movie, hopefully? Oh, so much. I mean, you know, for me, it's just about working with people that you absolutely love and trust and respect. It's, it's so important in anything you do, but especially comedy, because it's, it's so subjective, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, no one's right or wrong. It's just like if you and I find the same thing funny or not. So the idea of working with people that you have that shared sensibility with, that you trust, respect, mm -hmm. um, is crucial. Also, one thing that I actually came in with that I feel very strongly about is uh, in comedy cross-shooting when, when possible, because mm -hmm. I do think it's exactly what you're saying. Like, camera on me, camera on you. You and I are like <laughs> vamping comedy gold. I have it, you know what I mean? I don't have to try to read, as opposed to both, both cameras on me. You know, especially when you're working with people like Ali and Randall and Michelle Buteau and just, I mean, they're just Michelle Buteau is, incredible. is like the unsung hero of this movie. She's Obviously, so funny. Ali and Randall are delightful, but I want more people to talk about her. I know, I, me too, because she's so great and she's so funny. And she's just like a, like she just will run and just give you a ton of stuff, you know, so you just have to be ready for it. Is there any future, you think, for deleted scenes and extras over at Netflix? Like, have you guys talked about doing anything with maybe some outtakes like that? I, we, we have, definitely, and I'm hoping that there is some sort of platform that they, first of all, I think it would be huge. Like, if you could go on Netflix to, like, your favorite movie and go to, like, deleted scenes or extras or something. I would certainly watch all for of that. For sure, <laughs> like, on the movies you like. Because um, there were some scenes that got cut out of the movie that I personally thought were hilarious. There's one scene where Randall's character, Marcus, breaks up with Jenny, and it's so funny to me. Like, Vivian Bang it <laughs> just great too. is hilarious, and I'm, you know, I hope people get to see that at some point. I definitely want to. Is there <laughs> any talk about maybe mounting an Oscar campaign for the end credit song? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I've heard um, people talking about that. I would, look, uh, listen, 3-6 Mafia won, so... <laughs> I mean, maybe there's a chance that Randall and Dan the Automator could get in there. What I would give to see him perform that live <laughs> on stage at the Oscars, I can't even begin to tell you. It would be all like those legendary, and there's like Randall Park with Hello Peril performing. <laughs> that's <laughs> I the, punch Keanu Reeves. That's the thing, though. You find these hidden gems like that, and you know there's something special when you keep talking about them all throughout the year. And I feel like we're seeing stuff like that more so than ever now. Totally, totally. And it's amazing to see, you know, that's another thing that... Netflix was a great partner with because that song is playing at the end of the movie and normally when the credits start, you know how Netflix, your box become, your movie becomes yeah. like little and they're like next up and you've got like 10 seconds to either click out or whatever. Mm -hmm. They were on board with the song so they were like, we're going to keep your movie full screen so people can, you know, hear the song. It is so nice to hear that Isn't they that actually great? did that. I yeah. know. They I'm changed, so happy. changed the model a little bit. Yeah. So is another movie in your future, or are you looking to veer back to TV? Because I know you made the move uh, over to Universal, That's which right. is super exciting uh, earlier thank this you. year. I'm excited. Um, yeah, no, I, I think the ideal scenario would be to go back and forth, because I love TV. Um, I'd love to, you know, do some new stuff in that space, but I also really have enjoyed this experience and would definitely want to do another movie, so I think hopefully we can, you know, it's just a matter of planning, I guess, but going back and forth. And I'm so curious about the experience moving over to Universal, especially when you had been somewhere so successfully for so long. I imagine that process is, like, jarring and scary, but also really exciting. Totally, totally. I've had a great time at 20th. I've made some great stuff. I'm so proud of it. We had a great run and I'm very excited to start like this new chapter at Universal and like see what's up. But it is a thing that's like, you know, when you go to a new school basically and it's like, it's like going to college, right? Where it's like, you know, your high school campus, like the back of your hand and then you're sort of lost and you're like looking around with the map and you're like, where, where's everything? I don't know what's going on. I feel like given all the success you've had, you probably had your choice of wherever you wanted to go really. Is there any reason that Universal was like, that's, that's my place. That's where I want my next chapter. Well, I really had an amazing meeting with the whole creative team over there, like Perlina, who's in charge of the studio, and her team that she's assembled. And they were like, look, we want to support the show, whatever the show is. Like, of course, they sell, like, their sister network is NBC, but mm -hmm. they sell everywhere. And I really appreciated that. Like, you know, what does what the content dictate? You know, like, this could be a weird four-episode thing on a random channel that no one's ever heard of. And it's like, great, let's go make it. Because for me, I just want to make cool, interesting stuff. Like, I don't care where it lives, you know, just 
work with people who are passionate about it. Cool, interesting things with heart that are also diverse. I actually wrote down one quote that I love what you said, and you were telling this to Variety. You said, there are people who think change isn't happening fast enough, but it's actually happening. It's taking hold in a real way. And sometimes I think it's really important that that gets the point across, but like getting at the specifics and hearing those specifics verbalized, make them feel real. So would you yeah. mind elaborating on that a little? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, I guess, it is, you know, it is real. Like I'm sitting here with you, you know, talking about this stuff. Um, I had an opportunity, Ali and Randall co-wrote this script with Mike Galamco. You know, they, it was never a question of who should be in this movie. You know what I mean? It was always them. They had a story to tell. They wanted to write a movie that they wanted to see. Um, and it, it's like the more things that succeed, just open more and more doors for other people, for other stories, you know? And I think that like, to me, that's really exciting. You know, when Fresh Off the Boat came out, it was 2015. So it's only four years, you know, it's not that much time. But mm -hmm. if you think about everything that's happened in these last four years and like all those movies you referenced, it, you know, I mean, it's all just happened. So I'd rather be here in 2019 than where we were in 2015, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So and then. 20, you know, 23, like four years from now, just think about where we're being. I know. You know I, I like thinking about that in a really hopeful way, too. You, <laughs> yeah. never, you, never, you never know. There's so many things changing, and there's so many opportunities for things to change and then fall into place for the better. And I always have my fingers crossed, and I have a lot of faith in a lot of people out there now. Yeah, me too. Me too. And it's like, listen, there's certainly a long way to go. I'm not, you know, trying to say that there's complete parity because there's by no means. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, you know, we're in the right, we're going in the right direction. And things like Netflix making these kinds of movies, people like Universal wanting to make deals with people and tell stories about people that you don't, you haven't necessarily seen centered in that way before. Um, those are like the real things that are happening, you know? Another thing that I feel like verbalizing again always helps people out there, especially people who want to do what you're doing right now, is hearing about specific failures and also because we just got through like a whole bunch of TV pickups and, sure. and cancellations and everything. Is there ever an instance where like something you were working on didn't pan out and like you were super bummed but, you know, found some reason to rise to the occasion? I mean, totally. You know, it's so so much part of the game. Like. I was exec producing this pilot uh, last season that Rechna Ferkbaum uh, wrote and created, and it was the reboot of Greatest American Hero, yes. starring Hannah Simone. And I was so proud of that pilot. I think, you know, Rechna killed it, Hannah was amazing in it, and it didn't go. You know, it didn't get picked up. And that's one of those things that, like, you know, you feel that, you know what I mean? Because I know how amazing that show would have been, I know how important that would have been. There was another pilot Courtney King wrote about her story growing up mixed race in Philadelphia in the 80s. She's part Korean, part you know white, and she loved Paula Abdul because Paula Abdul was the only person that she saw that kind of looked like her in, in any remote way, and she wanted to be a Laker girl. And I loved that pilot. It was so good, and that didn't wind up going. Um, so there's always going to be setbacks, you know, that you stuff you believe in that for whatever reason it's not the time for, it doesn't mm -hmm. make it, and it's like. All you can, I mean, it hurts and you let it, you know, you let that, you know, don't trust a bitch getting canceled. Like that was, you know, very difficult for me as well. And, you know, you get drunk for a couple months and then you, <laughs> you, you sober up and you keep going, you know. Is there any opportunity to back pocket some of those things or like once they don't get picked up, is, is that kind of it? I mean, occasionally you'll hear about, you know, something sort of getting resurrected in a second, you know, life. But uh, those projects, you know, it's a little bit tricky because it's like the studio owns the rights and... Makes sense. You know. And it's so important with all of these shows and TVs and shows and movies and everything to have such a supportive group around you. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, is there anybody out there that's kind of doing something really special for the industry, whether it's over at Netflix or anywhere at all, that you say, I'm looking at that person, they're doing something good for everybody and I want to work with them? Well, I mean, you just have to, I mean, in all capacities, for sure. You know, you look at uh, networks, you know, what they're doing. You look at stream, like streaming services, like Netflix, like the stuff they're putting out. And you're like, I want to be a part of that. You know, I, I love what they're doing. I want to go over there. You look at different writers and directors and performers. You know, Kumail in Big Sick was an amazing movie. Mm -hmm. Talk about, you know, rom-coms in the theater. It's like that worked, you know. It's a great example. And And it was like. Nobody could have seen that coming that, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, all right, we'll see what happens. And the fact that audiences responded to it, 
was incredible. And Michael Showalter, you know, did an amazing job with that. Emily Gordon. And it's just, you know, creating opportunities for people's stories to be told in a different way. Um, I find so much of that exciting. And I have to just shout out, you know, Ali Wong. Yes. You know, coming up and just doing it her way, you know, not fitting into any box or any preconceived notion of like what that should look like and, you know, staying true to her voice and, you know, it's uh, it's inspiring. It's been so exciting, especially like the past couple of months. I feel like I've heard more stories like that than any where, yeah. you know, you have someone who, yeah, they might have had a big role in a movie, but they're taking their careers and they're running with them and they're creating their own. Like, I love the fact that Octavia Spencer in particular, totally. is she's using her star power now to make things that we weren't seeing before and even give herself some unique different opportunities that she might have not had before. That's it. That's it. You know, and it's like when you have the chance you know, what you do with it, I think is really telling. And I haven't seen her new movie. I'm very excited. <laughs> she's something else in it. <laughs> I mean, she looks like she's having so much fun too. And that makes me even happier for her, even though terrifying things are happening in that movie. <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> How did she get our numbers? You know where the party is. Mm, those earrings are beautiful, Maggie. I know, the trailer was wild. I'm it like, really is. I'm in. I'm in for this. What are you into right now? Like, do you actually have time to go see movies or, like, queue up another show on Netflix? I know. Well, I actually, because I love it so much, it's kind of relaxing to me to, like, just watch things that I've heard great things about. I mean, Killing Eve just ended. Come on. Go get Jodie Comer what in something happening? that you're doing. I love I, her so much. On <laughs> earth? Like, I remember, like, some, I did something... Well, you know where they do those interviews where they ask you like the same three questions, like they ask a bunch of show. Oh, the generic. Like, the generic yeah. like three questions and they just print everybody's responses or whatever. One of the questions was, what TV character do you wish you could have written for past or present? And I was like, I'm sure I'm going to come up with something better like in a half hour when I'm walking down the street. But the immediate thing that came to my mind was Villanelle from Killing. I'm like, are you kidding? Like a bored millennial queer <laughs> assassin? Like, I would write that for the rest of my life. I you think know? she's probably one of my favorite characters created in recent years. It's so funny. And it's she's so, funny. so good in that role. So that makes good. me want to ask you more of our Collider random questions. Um, <laughs> I also want to shout out Haunting of Hill House. Did you see that? Don't get me started Incredible. on Haunting of Hill House. Because <laughs> I'm like not a huge horror like genre fan, so I wasn't going to watch it. And my girlfriend was like, you have to watch this. That's she's a like, special one. I'll watch it together with you. I, my mind was blown. Horror is my genre, so I, like, I don't have big reactions to certain scary things anymore. Episode 8, there is one scare in that episode, and it was hands down the thing that year that made me jump more than anything. Oh, I know it's exactly. So was well that done. the car? The car scene. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, but for me, it's like I get goosebumps with the stuff like when Luke was an adult, and then you, that man, the ghost, the tall ghost that only has his back to him with the bowler hat. The design is incredible. The design, and then as he's moving, as Luke, the man is moving, the thing's just floating with him. And it's so, it gives me goosebumps right now to talk about it because it's like how you can't escape your past. Yeah. Like your childhood, it's all about trauma. And your childhood trauma moves with you no matter what you do. And it's just so smart on so many levels. I was such a huge fan. That's the thing with I feel like a lot of the content that we constantly talk about and that's really something special is it'll take like a genre like in that case horror or in your case romantic comedy and yes, we'll deliver on all the things you know and love in that genre but Mm -hmm. also add this extra layer that makes you think twice, makes you relate and walking away from your movie in particular, the whole concept of you can have a relationship and you can have a career is Mm -hmm. really something special. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that was important too. It's like you know, we, it was really important storytelling for us to like make sure that these two people, even though they might not come from the same place, they might have different, you know, views on a lot of things, that neither of them has to dim their light for the mm-hmm. other, you know, and there is compromise in, in all that, but it's like, you don't want to suddenly be like, oh, let me give this up, you know, the sort of traditional rom-com, maybe female characters in the past have had to sort of diminish themselves a little bit. And it's like, I I don't want to see that. You know what I mean? I don't want my seven-year-old niece to see that. And I think that, you know, without getting on any soapboxes, just to sort of say, like, we're both equal here. Like, you know, and Allie's character's at fault, too. It's like, she doesn't understand why he doesn't want more. You know, and it's like someone who's ambitious, it's like, 
he's so talented. And she's like, don't you want more? You could be so great. And he's like, no, I'm good. It's crazy you know? to think that you can have it all by like conceding certain things totally. with the other person. Totally. And like, that's kind of the, that's the vibe that this gives you in the end. And it really, it like filled my heart. It made me oh, very happy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy. I, wait, I want to see if I could think of any good random questions. Oh yeah. Hit me with those colliders. If, if you could <laughs> direct one episode of any TV show out there, what would it be and why? God, I mean, one episode of, we talked about Killing Eve. Yes. I think that would be an amazing uh, experience to direct an episode of that. Um, if you went the horror route and did Hill House, like, would you ever want to do something like episode six? Like, I can't get the way that that was shot out of my head. That, I mean, <laughs> was crazy. I read so many articles about that. I would be, I would love the challenge. Let's put it that way. I would love the challenge. I think... Maybe after take three, when it didn't go well, I'd be like, you know what? Let's just what's Forget our backup? That. Let's just let's just back this up. After you're talking before about having more coverage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, hey, let's scrap this. Let's just shoot it regular. What's the background on your phone? The background on my phone, when I turn it on, like my home screen or whatever, is um, this rainbow that uh, my girlfriend and I saw when we were on vacation. I like that. <laughs> and then. My other screen is when you, like, behind all the apps is just this weird egg with a cowboy hat floating through the sky that a I saw. A weird egg? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Where did you see that? Uh, in Taiwan. We were shooting a Fresh Off the Boat episode out there. <laughs> there was, like, this cartoon egg that was floating around. And... I love when you find stuff like that and you make it the background of your phone because <laughs> then it, it never changes. Yeah, it's always there. Do you have any movie or TV props? In my house? Um, I have in my office... I have a prop that was made for the show. Um, we had Shaq, we had Shaquille O'Neal as a guest star on a couple episodes. And he was kind of this failed entrepreneur. <laughs> he was playing himself and uh, he ran like a series of car dealerships. And he had this failed line of uh, tequila called Shaquilla. And it was a glass basketball with like his head as the stopper. And the thing was like, you'd put it on the desk and it would just roll off and crash. And that's why it never sold. So I have a Shaquilla bottle that's in my office. Good thing to have saved. <laughs> I feel like you have to have a box of tennis balls somewhere too. Oh, I have tennis balls, definitely. <laughs> I have that Hello Barrel for sure. That would have been a good giveaway for something like this. <laughs> Let's see, which other ones come to mind right now? What's the movie you quote the most? Oh, man, the movie I quote the most. I mean, one of my, I don't know if it's the most, but one of my favorite movies that I probably know almost all the dialogue to is Broadcast News. Um, I just think it's a genius character study. It's funny. It's real. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I need, now I need to, re I've gotten in the habit of asking people that question and then going and just rewatching whatever they say. Please so I'm putting, that. I'm putting that on my list. The last person we had in said almost famous, which I've seen like God knows how many times, Love but I did just watch it the other day because she said it. So now I have to. Yes. <laughs> so I'm glad you suggested <laughs> something like that. Um, one other thing. Oh, because we said, would you rather before? Okay. And also I'm actually curious, uh, <laughs> how this applies to everything you've done. Would you rather have too much time and not enough money to make something or not enough money and too much time? Your colleague asked me that. D Dorian stole all my <laughs> questions. All right, so would you rather have a, a lot of money and a short amount of time to do filming or a short amount of money and a lot of filming time for your project? That's like one of my favorite <laughs> new ones that I came up with too. He sniped your questions and came into the London with I love like... that we're getting video proof of this. <laughs> I believe I said the one where you have too much money and not enough time because you could always buy a bunch of Red Bulls and just like stay <laughs> up, use your, use your money to what's, stay up. What's your onset vice? My onset vice, Chex Mix. Okay. If you put like a thing of, like it, I would just eat Chex Mix all day and then I'd be like, why, I don't want this. Take this away from me. <laughs> I like that. It's I feel like it's better than my coffee vice, which eventually like oh. spins me out of control by coffee, the end of the like, day. I don't even consider that a vice. I consider that like medicine. <laughs> like necessity. I need, yeah, oh, straight up necessity. I've cut myself off at like four cups for, for a day. No more <laughs> than that now. Let's see if he asked you this one. Would you rather test screen your movie or go with your gut? Test screen, definitely for comedy because there's so many even if it's j just for jokes and seeing like how scenes play within the greater thing, you'll feel when stuff starts to drag. Um, yeah, as long as everyone's cool with not like, it's not like the Bible, you know what I mean? You're not like react overreacting to anything. If, if it can be a working tool, then yeah, definitely. Okay. 
<laughs> now I'm afraid to ask any more would you rather's, Dorian. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we have to wrap this up anyway. But I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for was... being here. Again, huge congratulations on this movie. Always be my maybe. Seriously, if you need a little light in your life, a smile on your face, <laughs> cue it up, watch it right now. But congratulations on all the continued success, and I can't wait to see what the next chapter holds. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. This has of been delightful. Of course. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Collider Ladies Night. Please like and share it. We're going to see you soon with even more of them.